Okay, well, welcome everybody. I um, just want to say a few bits about Building to Last. Um, our goal and all that we're trying to do at Building to Last uh, is about growing and sustaining labourers. That's our little catchphrase. Uh, we want to help support and equip people like you to live out your calling to be disciples and to make disciples of others. And we've had a great time thinking about the first part, being disciples. Um, we thought about the life of Joseph at some length, but now we want to turn our, our thoughts to the second part, this idea of making disciples of others. In the Navigators, we often use the term labourer, if you've been around long enough and looking around, most of you have. Um, we often use this term labourer, or some translations use worker. And the idea of being a labourer is is bound up in the outworkings of all that God has given to us. And so as we grow in our relationship with God and our understanding of his word and his blessings to us, there's this natural overflow into the lives of the people around us. And what this looks like is going to be very different for each one of us because God has not made us the same. We're unique. We've got different personalities, different gifts, and that brings different opportunities. But over the next uh, nine months or so, we're going to be thinking about some inspiring lives, particularly in the early church. Now, I told I was talking to Jez about this on Monday. So there's several references to you, Jez, in this in this session. And Jez asked me, was was inspiring a verb or an adjective? And my answer was both. You see, we're going to be talking about some people that are very inspiring examples that we have in the Bible. But we, too, get our chance to be inspiring people, to live inspiring lives amidst all that God is doing in our midst, to live that kind of life amongst the people we do life with, people in the playground, in the workplace, people that live in our community or even in our, in our houses or places of living. So what I'd like to do is send us into groups. Um, and we're gonna just talk about these two questions. Um, so firstly, just it's a chance to introduce yourself a bit. Who are you if you don't already know or catch up if you do and um, share what's most inspired you in life. And that might be enough for you in this five minutes. Um, or you can get into the second question about what kind of inspiring examples do you see in the world around us? I don't know if you just want to take a screen print of that or however you want to do it with your camera and then it will disappear. I'll give you five, four, three, two, one. Welcome back, everybody, and welcome, Jim. Hello. Good to see you. <laughs> um, I realise that was probably woefully short in terms of time, and you probably just started getting catching up and all sorts of things. I'm going to send you back into groups in a very short period of time, so don't fear. Um, but I need to just say a few more things and get us teed up for the next group time, which is going to be the longest of our group sessions. Um, tonight is something of an introduction to the series that we're going to be going through. And we're thinking about the kinds of people that God uses. And so in the early church, we find a generation of people used by the Holy Spirit to turn the world upside down. And many of the examples that we're going to be talking about um, are people who've been impacted by the life of Paul. And Paul sought to invest deeply in the lives of others in such a way that they'd be able to reproduce what he'd done in their lives, in the lives of others. Have a look at this, these verses here. Paul says to Timothy, you, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, Patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings. What kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium and Lystra? The persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. You see, for Paul, discipleship was 24-7. It was whole life. 
uh, the people uh, that Paul invested in would see every aspect of his life, his purpose, his passion. The things perhaps we wouldn't want people to see. Now, clearly, in, in our day and age, we can't spend 24-7 with people. But the challenge is still there to share life together. Might seem really at odds with our individualistic culture, our nine to five work routine. But there's huge potential for growth if we can work through what it might mean for our generation. I'm going to show you a clip, a short video clip, and um, you've got to work with me on this one. It is quite fun. Um, yeah, the, the, the clip is about a chessboard. And um, Imagine starting from one and each time you move to a new square, you double it and they put a piece of rice on each one and we see where we get to. So let me go. Here we are. Give me a thumbs up that you can hear that. sheer look on your faces is incredible <laughs> and but also incredible is the sheer power of multiplication and you don't need to be a mathematician like Jez to know that and um, the reason I show that is because the power of making disciples of others has the potential um, to be also quite exciting now I would have to say that things are never as neat with people as they are in the rice and chessboard illustration you know, if if your lifetime's worth of disciple making doesn't look like this, then it's that's probably that's probably to be expected. Um, but it does illustrate that the power of investing in a, one other person who can then invest in someone else and you can start investing in someone else, too. And then as it invests beyond that generation, the next generation. It's hugely exciting just to think of the potential that we can have um, well beyond our lives and our generation. And so our big question, um, our big question um, this year is going to be how are we going to invest our lives? How are we going to live in such a way um, that we can have maximum in impact on the people around us? And so tonight, uh, we're going to think a little bit, uh, not just about the life of Paul, um, but a guy called Ananias. Uh, but we're going to start with Saul. And um, this is where it gets slightly confusing, because in the passage we're going to look at tonight, Paul is called Saul. And um, it gets 
I'm, it gets very muddled in my head as to which one I'm talking about. So let's just let's just agree to, to see that synonymously. Saul is called Paul soon enough. And um, we can learn a lot uh, from the life of Saul or Paul. And I want you to spend a bit of time in your groups thinking about this. So, again, if you can take particularly those who are leading, if you can take a, a screenshot of this. Now, I've put a lot of verses up there, but essentially our core passage tonight is going to be Acts 9. That's the key one. But Paul tells his story of how he comes to faith, his conversion experience on the Damascus Road in chapter 22 and then in chapter 26. So there's some alternate passages. Um, now, what I'd like to do is ask, um, let's see, if everybody could do, do his background. Um, actually, that doesn't work, does it? No. Um, yeah, why don't we just all try and do all three? Don't, don't get too bogged down with this. Um, see how you go. I'm going to give you 15 minutes and I'll try and float in amongst the groups. Um, but this is, uh, this is practical. What here do we learn uh, about the, the following aspects of Paul's life and what, what, is a, what here was a shock or surprise about the kind of man that, that God chooses to use? Welcome back, people. Um, maybe we can have uh, the group's feedback, but I shall pick on a group for each section. Um, maybe Holly's group, you could feedback on Saul's background. Give us a few thoughts. Who's your spokesman, spokesperson? We did not choose one. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it was just, it was amazing how God chose someone who was so aggressively anti-Jesus, uh, yeah. anti-Christians, and yeah, um, just quite amazing that he could do such a big transformation in somebody. Um, and perhaps in a person that we would write off if we were thinking about someone to disciple. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and more than anti, because the Galatians passage says he was trying to destroy the church. Um, totally wipe it out, yeah. Hmm. Did anyone else have anything they wanted to share from my group? My memory's not good. <laughs> looks looks good no it's pretty good um there was a few other things in there I and mean, he's described as being full of confidence in all sorts of things in philippians a hebrew of hebrews he was very zealous um, he'd been thoroughly trained uh in in judaism he was a jew he was born in tarsus and uh, his father was a pharisee he was a roman citizen he was a tent maker by trade um, but God chose him. Okay, what about conversion then? Let's go for um, Beth's group. Um, well, we were pretty, we had a kind of robust discussion about conversion and how it happens in the places where we live. Um, uh, one of the folks in our group mentioned that where they live, there is a sense that the miraculous, there should be some sort of miracle accompanying conversion and then other folks said you know in other places like it's a shock if there's a miracle so we were just talking about the process of his conversion which we did there was a you know sudden miracle from dark to light um i mean literal darkness of seeing to light um and we were looking at like well how does that happen in our lives you know is that i mean we kind of came to the the idea that you know there's always it's always miraculous when god saves us um even if it doesn't look like like um like we're physically blind we are blind um and so god does this process over and over and over again um in bringing us to light but that's what we talked about in our group great that's a really good summary thanks beth and then let's jump into the last part jez give us or, one, or your can I, can I nominate uh, Ian? Could I, could I ask you to share a little bit about what we were saying? 
Yes, uh, we said a number of things. This is about his calling, right? Uh, we've That's mostly right. we mostly looked at um, God basically announcing Saul's calling straight away, um, both to Ananias and to Paul. Um, so we honed in sort of at one point on a particular verse where God is speaking to Ananias, uh, telling, explaining what Paul is going to do. And he's saying, uh, this is Acts 9.15, saying, but the Lord said to him, uh, to Ananias, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. And we looked at uh, how Paul sort of took to his calling very, very, very seriously, as seriously as he had been uh, persecuting the church to begin with. And uh, yeah, his willingness to go straight away was really good. And uh, I don't know if there's more that we said. I think That's there great. is, but I can't quite remember. Sounds great. Thank you, Ian. That's really helpful. Uh, really good. I hope you enjoyed that little kind of case study of, of the life of Paul. I think we, we've all kind of said that he was a pretty unlikely person to choose, but God seems to love to choose to work through people who are weak, inadequate, unlikely. He likes to perform the most radical turnarounds in people's lives. And if God can use someone like Saul, why can't he use people like us? But of course, it wasn't all on Paul. And in time, his mission would be worked out through a whole host of like-minded people, co-workers, supporters, people who would be uh, leaders in specific and um, specific places, and um, some people who would be much more mobile. Here we are. This is what I was looking for. Um, it's a quote I quite like. Um, it says, Paul was an astute judge of people and a highly effective leader. Had he merely operated alone, he would not have unleashed the explosive movement that, that began with him. By no means of least importance is that Paul's fellow workers continued his work far into the future. And of course, this man, Saul, who became Paul, will go on to author 13 of the 27 books in the New Testament. And his life and ministry would be the, the focus of over half of the book of Acts. Rather than Jesus, arguably, Paul would go on to have a greater influence on the develop development of the early church than, than perhaps anyone else. OK, so that's Paul. We're going to dive into the uh, second part tonight, which will be much briefer, Ananias. Um, let's have a look at Ananias. And there's three people in the Bible called Ananias. Um, one of them is the husband of Sapphira, Ananias and Sapphira. One of them is the high priest. Um, but here in Acts 9, it's the man that God sends to Saul. And in verse 10, he's described as a disciple, and he likely lived uh, in Damascus there. And Acts 22, verse 12, goes further, describing him as a devout observer of the law and a highly respected um, by all the Jews living, living there. Straight away, Ananias presents a challenge. What about our own reputations? What would people say about us? I wonder. Well, here's, here's a few lessons from Ananias. First of all, he was open to hearing God's voice. God takes the initiative um, in appearing to Ananias, and um, he clearly uh, knew Jesus' voice. He's able to respond to it. He's able to, to recognise um, that it came from God, and he responded, yes, Lord. And the instructions are quite specific. A particular house on a particular street, and he was to ask for Saul from Tarsus. He was told that Saul had had a vision uh, about him coming to place hands on him so that, he could, so that he could have his sight restored. 
It's a very detailed instruction and God was making it very clear to him what was needed to happen. And I think Ananias has got enough space and experience of God in his life to know and respond to God's voice. Second challenge to us, do we know Jesus' voice? Would you be ready? Would you have the space in your life to respond? Would it be yes, Lord? Thirdly, he demonstrates his weakness. We don't know a huge amount about, about Ananias, but I love that he demonstrates this sense of weakness and humanity. It seems he kind of forgot his place before God. He thought he knew all about Saul. But God also knew all about Saul, and he didn't need to be reminded. Can I, I'm sure we can all identify with him here. Surely God had got the wrong end of the stick. Surely not this man, of all people, that God would want to use him. Just imagine the fear in his heart at the thought of going to this man who had letters empowering him to arrest, to detail, detain or even kill people like him i wonder do you find yourself in a place of disbelief because of the power of god at work in other people people that you would have never thought that god would want to use uh, or be involved with and then lastly he's willing to obey god is very gracious to ananias and he can he reaffirms that yes he really has got the right guy and so God tells him to go and Ananias obeys. See, our perspective is, is often so limited, but God knows what he's doing. Our small acts of obedience can play a huge part. Obedience, of course, is rarely comfortable or easy, um, but he does it wholeheartedly. Notice in verse 17 that when he went to Saul and placed his hands on him, he addressed him as brother Saul. He greeted him as a brother and explained that he'd been sent so that he might be filled with the spirit. And that's exactly what was what happened. And Saul's sight was restored and something like scales fell from his eyes. You see, Ananias was a man of faith who took a massive risk to help the man who was such a huge threat to him. Not everyone can be a poor. Not everyone wants to be a poor, but we can all be an, an, an Ananias. We can all respond in those small ways. Of course, for Ananias, was, there was an extraordinary supernatural element to this. But, but the bottom line is God asked him to do something and he responded in faith, even though it seemed contrary uh, to good common sense. Simple, simple obedience and the gospel was advancing amidst our weakness and our unbelief are we willing to listen for the voice of God and respond in obedience to his call might be a really small thing just taking a small opportunity um, to speak about Jesus or share our faith or say that cutting question that really helps someone think about something in their lives okay I'm going to send you back into groups and um, here's your question. Um, what, what lessons do you think we can learn from his example? And um, in what ways does his example and the role that he played inspire you about helping? Welcome back, everybody. Great. Time is flying away and I'd like to give you the last five minutes to just pray. So we're going to dive into the third part people God uses and us um, but first just to kind of close out the Saul and Ananias stuff um, I can't believe that either of them would have been too high up many of our short lists I'm pretty sure not many of us would be too high on our own short lists um, Ananias clearly felt that way about Paul um, and in turn in time the early church found it quite difficult to believe that this man, Paul, had made such a transformation. But in all of his weakness, he was going to be the one to take the gospel to the Gentiles and begin to turn the world upside down through the power of the Spirit. Um, but did he do that? 
well, which countries did Paul take the gospel to? You can see on the screen, got Italy up there, uh, Malta, exciting for the Maltese. Uh, we've got, got Asia over here, Cyprus, Syria, which is the one up there, Turkey, I think. Oh, we've gone too far. Six, six different countries and maybe further afield. And that this man was able to take the gospel to. And these places and names, probably many more, were part of the fulfillment of God's call to take the gospel to the Gentiles. This was the result of a life of obedience to fully participate in God's purposes. God uses people who are available to him. And if God can use someone like Paul, as I said, he can certainly use us. Because it's not about us, but about the grace of God at work in us. Who are the people that Paul significantly influenced? Well, here's a, here's a simple list of his travel companions, um, his co-workers and fellow prisoners, supporters, and then key people of influence um, that he was involved with. Quite a, quite a staggering list of people in lots of different places, at least 10 people in depth, probably 70 to 100 more people uh, more widely. Many of these people travelled with Paul and as ever he turned those trips into, into training opportunities with them. Let me ask you, how would you describe God's criteria for the people that he chooses uh, to use in his purposes? Do you want to chew that over in your mind a moment? And the navigators, an, an old an old acronym, which now sounds quite cheesy and probably um, politically incorrect, is that God likes to use fat people. People that are faithful, that's the S. They're available, that's the A. And teachable, that's the T. People who are willing to be involved in others. It's going to look quite different um, because we are different people. We won't have the same impact on others that others will have. But there's massive potential because this is not about us, but about the grace of God at work in us. Did you notice um, that we probably didn't, but the, the, the list of people is quite different. Let's have a look at that slide on the screen there. Now, Luke is, is a physician. He's a writer. Silas and, and Mark also, they, they were the ones that ended up writing a huge chunk of the Bible. Paphras was an evangelist. He established three churches. Some of these people from, were from wealthy or skilled environments. People like Phoebe, who was a benefactor, or Philemon, Philemon who was a, a slave owner. Some of them were able to use their homes like Gaius and Lydia. Different kinds of people working out the same vision to reach people in different ways, in different contexts, and using their unique gifts and the ways that God had blessed them. These people are not all mini Pauls made in his image. They're different, and so are we. And so as we conclude, can I encourage you that God can use us. As long as we're prepared to make ourselves available to him. Perhaps you're going to have an opportunity uh, over the weekend or next week to follow God's leading by meeting up with a friend. Maybe saying something quite pointed to them that will help them move towards Jesus. Perhaps you have a, fr a friend that you get a chance to, to, to build up, someone who's struggling perhaps. Maybe your involvement with them will be a huge turning point in their struggle. We just don't know the power and potential that any of our interactions can have with others. God can use them in his purposes. Thinking back to my own uh, life, these people on the screen have been really inspiring to me over the years. This past week, I met with Dave Morich, and he was the first navigator that I met. And I'm just staggered by Dave's single-minded focus to help others. In the past few years, he's relocated himself close to the university here in Southampton. And even at the age of 68, he's still giving his life to helping as many 
international students as he can. He said he's got no time to do the kind of old people stuff at the, uh, the retirement home that he's living at because he's too busy helping other people. And then there's Jez and Alison. They were the next uh, navigators I met. And I worked with Jez for uh, a few years before they fled the country to go to France. Our friendship, of course, has always been close. And I, but I marvel at his love, his concern, and his pastoral heart for me. And then Tompey. Tompey died in 2019. And he was there at times when, when others couldn't be. And when he finally convinced me that I should come along to formation school, it set in, in motion a series of events that would eventually see me stepping into his shoes to lead it. Not in the circumstances I would have, want, uh, would have wanted, but it's been, it's been quite a ride. And, you know, I really miss the fact that Tom is not there alongside me while I'm doing it. And so all of these folk have been really significant for me at times. Their, their encouragements to walk closely with Jesus have been very timely. And they've helped me and encouraged me to help others to do the same. I wouldn't be where I am now without their timely and significant influence in my life. And so the challenge I want to leave you with this evening is to let our attitude be here am I, rather than please send someone else. Which fits quite nicely with what we were talking about in one of the groups. Or, or to say that I'm not very good at that, or I can't speak, or I can't do whatever. Throughout the history of the Bible, God has used some of the most unlikely people to work out his purposes. Not because they were great, but because they loved God, and they believed God and took him at his word. God could do it all himself, but he's all, always sought to work through people like us. Listen to this carefully. God could have sent a legion of angels to do his work, but he chose to send people like us. God loves to send ordinary people like us to do, to do extraordinary things that bring great glory to him. OK, we're going to go into groups for just five minutes and then we're done just to spend a few minutes to share one thing that stood out and then just pray together. I'm sorry we've run over slightly. Uh, my timing's not anywhere near as good as Beth's. Um, but the good news is we're back next month um, with another gathering and Beth is going to be speaking. Um, here we are. Look, here's a flashy little flyer for you. Uh, we're going to be talking about Barnabas and the power of encouragement. So you can see, basically, we're going to work our way through some of Paul's friends. And um, I trust that you've had a good time this evening. Please uh, do feel free to nip off. But if you want to stick around, um, we'll keep the, uh, keep the doors open for another half an hour or so yet if people want to stay and chat.